So to sum up the first two things there, from the learning sciences, there's no such thing as variability, good or bad, without understanding context. You can't separate those two things, okay? You wanna know, you gotta know variability and how it interacts with a, a, an environment, your context, to know any outcome whatsoever, okay? But I told you um, up front that this was mainly a story about control, about how you could take control of your life. And I wanna say, to the last part of this talk, I wanna talk about how it is that students and parents, you look at this equation, like how would you use that to actually take control? Because just knowing the first part, just knowing variability does not give you control. In fact, at its worst, it can lead to helplessness. I have this, you know, I see the, if you ever look at the research, especially on ADHD, it's, it's kind of depressing. And, and it, it's easy to slip into that trap like this is destiny, okay? But just knowing that context matters doesn't give you control either. At its worst, it can lead to excuses. Everything is everybody else's fault. Control only comes from understanding how variability interacts with context, and specifically how your variability interacts with your context, okay? And I wanna talk about that for just a second. Um, but first I have to flip my notes over. This is called old school. So my technology didn't work. Okay, so I wanna talk for a minute about to the kids and then I wanna tell the parents something about how this equation matters. That, so how would you look at this and think, well, how do I get control? Because my guess is for a lot of kids, I, mean, I never felt like I had control, and it's really frustrating. It's as simple as this. You have to be the expert on you. That seems cheesy, but it's true. You have to know your own interesting variability. And to the extent that other people know more about you than you do, you don't have control. They do. And it sounds pretty straightforward, right? I just ticked off my interesting variability, which like is classic like ADHD, so okay, fine. You think, well, I got diagnosed with ADHD, that's mine too, not quite, right? Because it's always about the variability in context. Yeah, I'm impulsive and I buy cars I shouldn't buy. Maybe your environment's better than that and, and the impulsivity is not really the thing that's affecting your life. You gotta know that. And maybe it's stuff that no one's told you is interesting. So. How would you possibly do this? How, how would you do it? If it's such a mess, variability and context interacting, how could you possibly get started? Okay? And I want to tell you how I did, and I think there's not one way, but I can tell you how I did, and I'm hoping you'll come up with even a better way. The problem is, I can't just say, like I said, I can't just be like, hey, me and Tim both are, uh, have the same uh, symptoms that someone told us, right? Because what's interesting to me may be boring to you. I told you I like the smell of skunks, me and like one other person. Um, that's pretty boring. My grandfather, if he smells skunk, it basically wipes his memory for a day. Like amnesia kind of stuff. Like he doesn't know what's going on, he's like, he has no recollection. So the smell of skunk is a very interesting variability for him, okay? The other thing that makes it tricky is that one event, one um, incident, like me picking on Tim right now, is never gonna be able to tell you, was it your variability? Is it something about your context? What's the driver in this event, right? Because I'm, I'm gonna wager that every one of the kids here has had an instance where the label they've been given has been used as a weapon against them, as an ex explanation. You have a teacher who's actually kind of a jerk but it's because you have ADHD that things turned out the way they did on that argument. You know, and I, I, I've experienced it even at the level of being a doctoral student at Harvard. You know, I was working doing brain imaging at Mass General Hospital with a wonderful mentor. He went on somewhere else. Um, I made, uh, the person I went to work with knew that I had ADHD, and then any single thing that ever happened that didn't quite work out was always because I had ADHD. You know, so if I just listened, I'd say, okay, well, I guess that's the problem. So any one event could be your context, it could be your variability. Where, where you start to see your real interesting variability is trends, patterns over time. 
okay? And how I did that was I started just jotting things down. And I have to say, I've never told anybody this. I was so embarrassed that I was essentially keeping a journal of my screw-ups kind of thing. And, but it was, it was supposed to be a journal of interesting events, like when good things happened. But like over time, good things didn't seem to happen. <laughs> All my interesting events were kind of crappy. So I would just jot them down because I had no idea, right after I was married and had a kid, I had no idea why things turned out the way they did. Like it just seemed random to me. And I was sick of not having control. And I kept jotting these down. I mean, not like deep thoughts. I was just like, you know, I got in an argument with this person. <laughs> Here's what I think happened, just quickly. And I almost gave up on doing it because I thought like, Nothing seemed to happen for a while. It seemed like a waste of time. And then trends started to emerge from my own writing. And one trend in particular was so important to the direction of my life that I think it's, this is why I'm telling you, it's about trends. Let me tell you the trend. Let's get, it's back to boring, being bored and novelty seeking. That, as I told you before, the first two and a half years after I was married, I had 12 jobs. It's, probably, it's gotta be some kind of record, I think, but they weren't good jobs, they weren't jobs I enjoyed. They're the kind of jobs you could get if you're a high school dropout. And because I was having to live on pub, with public help, help as well, a lot of people saw me job hopping as not only irresponsible, which it may have been, um, but a sign that I was lazy. In fact, my father-in-law told me that to my face. Now, I have to say, I don't blame him. <laughs> I'm thinking about if I had a daughter and she just married this dropout who was going nowhere, who kept hopping around minimum wage jobs, that's probably, I mean, in fairness, that's probably what I would have come to as well. But, and that could have made, maybe it could have been something about me. But I happened to be jotting stuff down. I happened to be just writing down things that happened to me. And I just started looking at the things that happened in my jobs, and I realized, I don't think that's what's going on. Because I never was fired from any of those jobs, and at the beginning of every one of those jobs, I was pretty good at what I did. In fact, sometimes I won awards. <laughs> but the second that the job I had became routine, that I would show up and do the same thing over and over again without any thought, I was less than productive. And I just, I couldn't bear it. I, I'm not even an average employee anymore. <laughs> I'm just like useless. So I looked at this and I said, I don't think it's that I'm lazy. I think it's that I need to be challenged. And so, you know, I remember talking to my dad about this. And I said, look, this is what I think is going on. And he said, well, that's great. In fact, there's jobs out there that you get paid quite a bit. For someone who's willing to deal with the uncertainty, who doesn't need direction, who, who can kind of do what you want to do, be challenged all the time. The problem is, you can't get there from where you're at. And so, we felt like, pregnant pause, um, well, how could I do that, right? Well, you could start a business, or you could go to college. Since I had negative money in my bank account, starting a business didn't seem like a good idea. Um, so I went to college. And I wouldn't, I, I'm certain, I wouldn't have interpreted the events that were happening as I need to be challenged, and if I'm challenged, I'm pretty good at what I do. If I had to document, if I hadn't seen the trend, I would have gone with lazy, and my life would be different. So I think the, the thing that I think is really important as the kids is you've got to figure out a way to document this. Just trust me, you won't be able to do it in your head. <laughs> I can barely remember to mail my rent check, so I'm not going to do anything in my head. But as you start to know your own interesting variability, and you know yourself, I want to tell you what I think it means to have control, because it's not quite what you think it means, okay? At first I thought having control would mean I'd run the whole world. <laughs> you know? It's not like that. You'll know you're starting to have control over your own life when three, at least three things happen. One, because you know your own interesting variability, you'll start to be able to make choices and put yourself in context that are better fits for you when that's possible. And I don't just mean like I'm gonna to go to the right college or even stuff like that on a big scale. I mean little things like 
when I started going back to college, I went to a little commuter school that basically was a bunch of people that I went to school with in high school. And I found that when I would go into the class, I wanted to be different. But if there was anybody in the class that I went to high school with, I felt compelled to act a way I didn't want to act. It, it, it's crazy. Like I felt like I should be that screw up. And I would just withdraw from that class because I knew that no matter how strong I thought I was, I wasn't going to be able to be a different person. But being aware of those kind of ways that the context are shaping you is control. Second, we all have to be in environments that aren't a good fit. We all do. You'll know you're starting to have control when you know how to ask for help. And I have to say, if you're anything like me, I hated asking for help. It, it, I felt like it was a sign that something was wrong with me, that I was, you know, like, I think most kids that get the label of learning say, well, you get sick of it. You want to just do it. You don't want to have to ask for more time. You don't want to have to ask for a book that's read to you because you feel different. But I'm telling you, knowing your own variability and knowing not only when to ask for help, but the kind of help you need is control. The third thing, and this will seem even like not at all like control, but it is. Sometimes your interesting variability, like being impulsive in my case, no matter how hard you try, there's times when it just turns out so poorly that you need to put barriers in your own way. For me, it was credit cards. I'd get these cards and this time oh, I'm going to be really responsible because I'm a man. And then like, you know, two months later I had $5,000 worth of like, I don't even know what I bought. Like, at least I should have got a TV or something. Like, I don't even know how I racked up all this money on credit cards. So then I'd be like, okay, this next time for sure, I have control now. And then it would happen again. So finally, you realize that control means, look, I know how this turns out. And as much as I'd like to say that I, don't, I can control myself, I'm not able to. So I use debit cards up until last year. And it's kind of embarrassing when you're like a faculty member or someone, I don't have a credit card. <laughs> like, because at least using the debit card, when I would make impulsive purchases, it would hurt immediately. And that worked. And I got a credit card finally because I had to travel a lot. And it was like the scariest thing for me, like filling out the application. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, I can pay for it now, but it's still like so ingrained in me. Um,